This is it. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, this is our last session. Here we go. So we're going to be keeping the time, right, everyone? So uh, today's first speaker is uh, a makeup from yesterday, and we're going to hear from Vanessa Lopez Barquero, and she's going to be telling us about cosmic ray and isotropy from local turbulent magnetic fields. Okay, can you guys hear me? Wait. Like this? That's what I did, but okay, no. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so I'm making up this uh, talk from yesterday because I, I've been sick, so, um, so if I start coughing, don't worry, okay? I'm still alive. Okay, so. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about cosmic ray and isotropy that arises from local turbulent magnetic field effects. So this work I've done it here in the University of Wisconsin-Madison with my advisor Alex Lazarian, and then my collaborators Ryan Farber from Whedon College, uh, Siyao Xu from Peking University, and Paolo Duciati from UW-Madison. Okay. So the outline for my talk is going to be, uh, so first I'm going to be talking about the observational motivation behind this work. And then later on, I'll start talking about my specific work, right? So the turbulent magnetic field that I'm using, um, the cosmic ray trajectories that we compute, and the specific method that is going to be the backtracking, and how we can get anisotropy from um, these trajectories, OK? And later on, I'll give my results and conclusions, OK? All right, so let's get started. So first, let's talk about what is the problem in hand, right? So as good post Ptolemy <coughs> scientists that we are, right? So we believe that we don't necessarily live in a very special, unique place in the universe, right? So normally, so isotropy is a good assumption, right? So it works in uh, many cases. But the problem is that when we're dealing with cosmic rays arriving at the Earth, this is not the case, okay? And here, here's the evidence of that, right? So we observe um, oops, sorry. So what we observe is that there is some uh, anisotropy when it comes to cosmic ray arrival distribution at the Earth, okay? So, and this anisotropy is gonna be divided in uh, large scale anisotropy and small scale anisotropy, okay? So when we're dealing with uh, large scale anisotropy, so it's gonna be uh, this map here. So what we have here is cosmic rays arriving at the Earth so these uh, red spots that we have here, so there are uh, places where the density of events is really, really high. And when we have these spots here, blue spots here, so it's when it's really, really low, okay? So we have these large scales. So the large scales are gonna be related to the dipole and quadruple components, okay? But what happens if we take out these uh, large scales? So we take out the dipole and the quadruple, so what happens? So when we do that, so we have this map and then we take out this large scale, and we are left off with this small scale here, okay? So the small scale on the right that we can see there, so it's gonna be these higher multiples, right? So octopoles and so on and so forth. And what is important for us uh, today in this talk is gonna be these small scales, because these small scales are gonna be the ones that are gonna be reflecting the connection between the cosmic rays and its interaction with the local turbulent effects, okay? So this is where we're gonna be concentrating today. Okay, so the main question here is, does the, uh, does the turbulent effects, uh, so the turbulent features, right, so they actually create these small scale anisotropies that we observe? So what I did was uh, simulations trying to prove that this was actually the case, right? So let's start looking at this, okay? So first, of course, if we are propagating uh, particles, so we need a medium to propagate these particles, right? So I use this uh, magnetic field from the code described in Cho Lazarian in 2002. And this is a compressible MHT, it's a 512 cube, right? And the important uh, parameters that we need to know from this cube is that we have a mean magnetic field in the X direction that we're gonna be calling this as a three micro gauss uh, magnetic field, mean magnetic field. And the other parameter that is really important for us here is the advantage Mach number and that in this case is gonna be 0.773. So 
So what this means is that the perturbations of the magnetic field are of the order of the mean magnetic field. All right, so we have the medium. So let's start looking at the particles themselves, right? So of course, so we have uh, relativistic particles here. So we're going to be dealing with uh, PV particles. So the way that we calculate trajectories is, of course, with the Lorentz force, right? So what we do is, so we have a point, and then we interpolate the magnetic field at that point. And based on that magnetic field, so the next step that the particle does is based on the uh, Lorentz force, OK? All right, so we have the medium, we have the trajectory. So let's start talking about the particles themselves, OK? Uh, in this case, I'm just going to be limited to one of the sets that we um, simulated because, of course, I don't have a lot of time. But uh, in this case, so we're going to be dealing with an injection scale of 100 parsecs and then uh, 30 PV protons, OK? So as you guys know, so we have this nice power law when we're dealing with cosmic rays, right? So our 30 PV particles are going to be around the knee around here, OK? So this is going to be the region that our particles are going to be located. So very, very high energy particles, OK? All right, so we have uh, the medium, we have the particles. So we're ready to look at the problem that we had in hand, OK? So now here we have to stop, and then we have to think about what's going on, right? So this is, uh, this is the scenario for you guys to understand. So imagine that we have this very big sphere, so a 100 parsec sphere, right? And you have this tiny proton in this 100 parsec sphere. And then you want to hit a tiny, tiny, tiny target in the middle that is going to be the Earth, right? So this is almost impossible, right? And not only that, right? Not only is it really, really far away, but we have the ISM in the middle, right? So we have local turbulent um, magnetic fields that will try to deviate this particle to actually get to the target that is the Earth, right? So it's a very complicated problem. And then we have to find a way of circumvent this, right? So the way that I like to think about is like this, right? So let's say that uh, we have this target, right? So you want to shoot your arrow to the target, right? In this case, the arrow is the poor particle. And then the, uh, the target is going to be the Earth. But in this case, so our target is really, really far away. It's 100 parsecs, or maybe 10, depending on the region that we're going to be considering, right? So this target is really, really far away. And not only that, right? So we have the ASM. We have turbulent uh, magnetic field. So it's like you have this target that is really, really far away. And let's say that in the middle, we have this forest, in, right? So it's going to be really, really difficult to actually get to the target. So how do we circumvent this problem, right? So how do we get this to be manageable? OK? And the answer is, as I pointed out here, so is to use Liriel's theorem, right? So in the case of Liouville's theorem, so what this is going to be helping us is that through the Liouville's theorem, so we can relate the distribution at one specific radii to another specific radii, right? So in this case, to an outer sphere, to an inner sphere that we're going to be calling the Earth, OK? But the real question, and this is the problem with um, most of the works that have been done before, is that they don't consider the question that's really, really important, right? It's actually. Um, fundamental is that is Liouville's theorem actually applicable in these cases, right? Because Liouville's theorem is uh, really restrictive, and then we can use it just um, any way we want, right? So we have to find the conditions to use this theorem, OK? So the conditions that we found to use this theorem, so first, we have these uh, theoretical conditions. So first of all, so we need to have conservation of particles, right? We cannot have any particles escaping. Then uh, the second condition is that we need to have p divergence free forces, right? So this is why we limit ourselves to only magnetic forces, because magnetic forces are p divergence free. And the other important, and maybe the key fact about this, is that we need to have uh, forces that are conservative and differentiable, OK? So if we have forces that are conservative and differentiable, so this, of course, tells us that we cannot have collisions, right? And this is an important fact about this. So what happens if you have a region where the magnetic field varies abruptly, right? So we have this turbulent magnetic field. So what happens if we have this region, right? So maybe we can have an event that because the region varies so abruptly in the scale of the gyro radius that it can be considered a pseudo collision, right? So because of that, so we have to be really careful and try to assess how erratic are these changes, OK? So what's one way to assess how erratic are these changes? So 
So we calculated the first elevated invariant, okay? So the magnetic moment. So P perpendicular square over two MB, okay? So we calculate this uh, magnetic moment for all the particles at all time steps, and then we plot it here, okay? So what we have here is that, uh, so we have here the number of particles, and in the x-axis, so we have the standard deviation over the mean of this adiabatic invariant, okay? So what we have here is that we have conservation in this case, right? So perfect conservation will be at zero, but of course we have a turbulent field, so it's almost impossible. But 0.5 is actually really good, and this is why we are calling that um, this conservation of the first adiabatic invariant allows this uh, legal theorem to be applied, okay? And this is not always the case, right? So as my talk from tomorrow, so we're gonna be uh, looking at cases that do not uh, actually fulfill this conservation, okay? So I'm gonna be talking tomorrow about the heliosphere model and how particles interacting with the heliosphere do not have this conservation, okay? But for the moment now, right, so these uh, PV particles in a local turbulent effect, um, magnetic field, so they fulfill all the requirements to use the legal theorem, okay? So now we have our medium, we have our particles, and we have our theoretical background to actually use this theorem, okay? All right. Um, all right, so now we have all the background, right? So we need to know what's the process to actually compute the anisotropy, right? To actually compute the cosmic rate arrival distribution at the Earth. So the first, uh, the first part that we have to do is we have to input isotropically from the center, right? So we input particles isotropically from the center, and then later on, we let it propagate through the turbulent field, right? So they interact with the turbulent field, they, um, they experience all these different features of the turbulent field, and at some point, we record this distribution at this outer sphere, okay? So once we have uh, all the particles that have interacted with this turbulent field and they have, we have actually recorded them, so we input this dipole at that outer radius, and this is the point that we need to use uh, Liouville's theorem, right? Because now from this outer radius, so we need to relate this distribution to the distribution at the Earth. So we backtrack um, the particles at the Earth, and then we get the anisotropy, thanks, uh, because of the Liouville theorem, okay? So this is the process, right? So we input isotropically, we recorded that uh, outer radius, and then at the outer radius we input this dipole, and then we backtrack using level serum to the Earth, okay? So if we have this procedure, so let's take a look at what happens when we have the results, okay? All right, so these are the results that we get for small-scale anisotropy. So here uh, we have simulations, and here we have observations. Um, the problem with observations here is that for these very high energies, so we can only get to 5.4 PeV, and because it's the ice cube uh, data, so we only have the um, southern hemisphere, right? Because it's located at the south pole. Okay, but so what we can see is that we can answer our initial question, right? So our initial question was telling us that what happens uh, when we have these cosmic rays are uh, interacting with the turbulent field, right? So we see that we have um, an isotropy that arises from this, right? But this is a very qualitative uh, example. So let's take a look at what happens when we take a quantitative result from our paper. So, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll finish in one minute. Um, yeah, so when we have this, uh, this map, right? So what we do is we compute the angular power spectrum, and then we have this nice distribution of multiple moments, right? And this is where our question is actually answered, right? So if we have this connection between the cosmic rays and the turbulent magnetic field, so what we observe here is that we have all these multiple moments, all these higher multiple moments, they arise and they have a nice power here, right? So small scale structure actually arises from this interaction of the cosmic rays with the turbulent field, okay? And yep, so for my conclusion, so of course, uh, the local turbulent effects are crucial for cosmic ray arrival distribution, and then because of this uh, fulfillment of the requirements to use the liberal theorem, so we can apply it here, okay? Good. Thanks so much, Vanessa. So, thanks, Vanessa. We've got time for a quick question or two. Yes, Priscilla. How much does the dimensions of the ejection scale matter to the results? Yeah, so I, I've tried to use uh, 100 parsecs and 10 parsecs. 
So the the results are because we have uh, so the results we have to measure with respect to the injection scale. So in that case, uh, the injection scale will not matter in the sense of uh, actual anisotropy, right? Because this is uh, in this case will be uh, will not be sensitive to the, um, the actual the injection scale, right? So that's uh, that's one of the issues. But in this case, uh, I've tried both, and there the difference between them is not is not significant. Yeah. Okay. Any other very quick questions? All right. Let's, oh, go ahead, Anwar. Yes. In fact, the sun is near the hot cavity where probably the cosmic ray electrons and, uh, and protons, cosmic rays, are accelerated. So it's not just a position in the galaxy; it's just a specific position. Yeah. Would well, this uh, would this affect anisotropies? You mean the sun? Just the yeah, specific yeah, yeah. So, position yeah, of the yeah, sun yeah. So, with respect to the sources of the electrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it depends on the scale. Of course, it depends. Rays. It depends on the scale. So this is what I was telling. So in this case, um, so these these particles are really, really energetic. So they don't even see the sun. But when we're dealing with lower scales, so for example, my talk tomorrow that is going to be of the order of one TV um, scale. So then that so the effects of the of the sun and especially heliosphere. So that's going to be starting to matter, okay? So yeah, so that's a very good question. Everything depends on the scale. So this right. one is for very high energy particles, but if we go to lower, so then All other right. effects are- Thank you so much, Vanessa, appreciate it. Yeah.